The goal of RPA is to automate as many business processes throughout your entire enterprise as possible. If we don't understand the processes, it makes it much more difficult to arrive at a robot that does the appropriate work. Using flowcharts to describe processes will not only benefit the manual execution of processes, it will also increase our chances of succeeding with RPA. It's important that everybody on your team has a consistent understanding of how flowcharts work so you can best communicate and collaborate on processes. So in this lecture, I'll start with some flowchart fundamentals so you can get all of your team members on the same page. After that, I'll discuss some best practices so you have some clear guidelines about how to most effectively create flowcharts. Then I'll move on and give a quick demo of how to create a flowchart using a free and easy tool available to anyone. Finally, I'll give a demo to show how using your RPA tools flowcharting capabilities can increase your opportunities to collaborate. So let's jump into it. Let's take a look at some flowchart fundamentals. When we're at work, humans perform daily processes involving a sequence of steps. Ideally, any of these processes should be consistently understood and performed by anybody on the team. Our processes should be optimized, and what I mean by that is we use mapped drives, shortcuts, and macros to make the process as efficient as possible and reduce the number of clicks that are required to get a task done. They should also be standardized, meaning that everybody does it the same way. It's critical to have definitive clarity when we begin trying to automate processes. We need to understand the happy path of the process, any exceptions that might occur, and which roles perform which aspects of the process. A well-constructed flowchart can facilitate consistent understanding of any process. Flowcharts make onboarding easier as well because they will improve consistency of knowledge from team member to team member, and they reduce the tribal knowledge problem. And what I mean by that is, if whenever you're onboarding a new person, they get assigned to somebody who teaches them how to do these various tasks, that new person is dependent upon the person who's teaching them to show them all the steps the same way without any kind of personal bias. And that can be tricky because over time, humans tend to form their own opinions about the right way to do things. A flowchart, on the other hand, can be developed and refined to articulate a process in a clear and unambiguous way. Here's a basic example of what a flowchart looks like. We're always going to start with what we call terminators. We'll have one at the beginning and one at the end of our process. Then we typically add in blocks that represent activities that are being performed within the process. So in this case, an alarm rings. What happens after the alarm rings? We get out of bed. So between our start and end terminators, we have two activities in our flowchart. So that the viewer can understand the direction in which the process is executed, we connect all the activities with arrows. In some processes, we'll need to make a decision. In this case, the decision is, are we ready to get up? And you can see that the happy path continues by following the yes branch of this decision diamond. Using the decision diamond also gives us an opportunity to make a different decision. In this case, we have a new path of execution with an activity called hit the snooze button. If we follow that path, we can see there's an activity of a five minute delay. And then to complete the process, we simply add an arrow and that represents a loop in our process. If we wanted to, we could add text to the right of that delay that indicates how many times it's possible to go through that loop and what happens if we exceed that maximum number. You can see that this flowchart is aligned vertically. We can also accomplish the same thing by setting it up horizontally. Ideally, your flowcharts will either read from top to bottom like this, and notice at the decision, we also have a left to right flow for the no path. Alternatively, your flowcharts should read from left to right. And again, here at the decision, we're moving downward as well. So whether to use a vertical flowchart or a horizontal flowchart is going to depend on your specific process and how it best fits on one page. There are two common types of flowcharts. The first one being the process flow, which is very similar to the example we just saw. And here you can see that we have no sense of which role is performing which activity. We register as a user, we generate an order, request a payment, then there's an agreement decision, and for a no path, we cancel the order. For a yes path, we check the payment, receive the payment, and the order completes. 
A swim lane diagram is a type of flowchart that offers a little more information. And many flowchart tools give us the ability to create a swim lane background like this that actually look like the lanes you might see in an Olympic swimming pool. You can see on the left side, we've got the title of the process. And then each of the lanes represents a different role that participates in this process. So you can see that we have two terminators where we place the order and then the process finishes. And once the customer places the order, the sales role will receive the order. And notice the shape of that activity is a little different than the shapes we've seen in the past. Once the salesperson receives the order, a stock person checks to see if it's in stock. And then we have a decision diamond with a yes and no path. If we follow the yes path, it goes down to the finance role who authorizes their credit card. And then another decision if the card is valid. If it's not, we cancel the order. If it is, we process the card. Then the stock person packs and ships and the customer receives their order. So you can see that the extra level of detail in a swim lane diagram is definitely helpful. Flowcharts have been used in business for decades, and there are many standards and conventions that have evolved throughout those years. One of those standards are the types of symbols you'd see within any given flowchart. We've already seen the terminator symbol and the process symbol. Those are easily the two most common symbols, followed by the decision symbol and an alternative for the process symbol, which is the predefined process. And the nuance there is that a process might be something a little more ambiguous, whereas the predefined process symbol represents a very well-structured and well-known process. On the right side, we see that we've got a document symbol and also a multiple documents symbol. We also have a manual input symbol and a delay symbol. There are actually many other symbols that are less commonly used, but the symbols shown here should suffice for almost any process you need to define. As you'll hear me mention in the best practices video, it's not required that you know and use all these different kinds of symbols. You can get by just fine using the terminators, process, decision, and delay. The most popular flowchart tools are created by Microsoft. The one that's used most frequently is Microsoft Visio. The whole purpose of that application is for creating flowcharts, org charts, software development diagrams, and so on. Microsoft PowerPoint also has features to allow you to create flowcharts, and they can be accessed simply by clicking the Insert menu and clicking on Shapes. And you can see right here, we've got a number of the most common flowchart symbols. And if you hover over them, it gives you a hint about the purpose for that symbol. Microsoft Excel has similar functionality, and you'll most likely use one or more of those tools in any enterprise scenario. In this section, I'd like to introduce you to Draw.io which is a website that provides a free flowchart creation tool that's very simple, very intuitive, and best of all, free for anybody to use. Now that you have a general sense of what flowcharts are, let's take a look at some best practices. As I mentioned before, don't get too wrapped up in the formality of all this. Conventions are certainly valuable, but RPA as an industry is an evolution. So don't be afraid to experiment a little bit and figure out what works best for your team. Be sure to discuss and agree within your team what level of detail is going to be sufficient to achieve your goals. Ultimately, try to fit the whole process on one page. If you can't do that, a great approach is to create a simple high-level flow that fits on one page and then use single-page sub-processes as necessary. And ideally, you want to use a tool that allows you to hyperlink those together for easy access. And you'll see me demo that in the next lecture. Consider referring to external process documents and or videos for extra color. And what I mean there is, you could easily include a hyperlink to a Word document that has a bunch of more verbose steps and screenshots, or even a narrated video that walks somebody through a process. Flowcharts are great for getting an understanding of the flow, but being able to sit back and watch a video about a complex sub-process can be really helpful, especially for somebody who's never done the process before and is trying to help automate it. If you're working at a major company, you should certainly consider using version control to more easily track and revert changes to your flowchart documents. That's just a best practice for any kind of documents, whether it be flowcharts, software robot scripts, or programming code. Make sure your flowchart has consistent and appealing format. It should flow from left to right and or from top to bottom. Various subprocesses should be equally sized and spaced your decision diamond outlets should ideally be on consistent sides. 
use a maximum of three different colors for nodes. You certainly don't want a flowchart that looks like a rainbow. Try to use the same font for all the text, and in some cases it might be a little bit bigger or more bold, or even red if you need to call attention to something. Get familiar with your RPA tools flowchart capabilities. Once you're familiar with those, use the RPA version of your flowcharts to help facilitate parallel work. And by that, I mean multiple developers working on different parts of the robot at the same time. Let the flowcharting process help identify reusable processes. And what I mean there is, maybe there's an invoicing process that's used by two different systems. Ideally, you're going to want to create one flowchart for that invoicing process and reference it for those two other systems. That way, if the invoicing process changes, you only have to change it in one spot. And that's a big tip for you when you're building a robot that indicates that that invoicing process should be created as a standalone workflow that maybe multiple robots can interact with. You will most likely wind up with two different versions of a flowchart, a manual flowchart, and then one that's been modified or enhanced to help build the RPA workflow. And that RPA version of the flowchart might contain more specific details for the software robot developers to accomplish their work. The RPA flowchart might also be split into more pieces representing different reusable workflows. And finally, if you're creating an attended robot, maybe you'll make the robot activities a different color from the activities that the human performs. So keeping all those best practices in mind, Let's go have a quick look at the draw.io web tool for creating flowcharts. In the flowchart fundamentals video, I gave you a walkthrough of a basic flowchart. So by now, you should already have a good understanding of how to create a flowchart for your own processes. Let's take a look at a free, easy flowchart creation tool that you could consider using if you don't already have access to Microsoft Visio or PowerPoint. So in my browser, I'm heading to the address draw.io. And when the page loads, you see down here at the bottom, you can click on this quick start video link to watch a tutorial video about the product. You also have an option to create a new diagram or open an existing diagram. You can change the language of the interface by clicking this icon down here. They also have a help mechanism if you click on this link. It opens a new window and you've got very well organized help topics over here on the left. So I'll click on create a new diagram and we've got all sorts of interesting templates and you can scroll through and take a look at those. If we go into flowcharts here, you get a sense that we have a swim lane option there. This one is for data flow and a variety of other looks and feels. I'll just go back here to basic and click on blank diagram. We can label it up here at the top if we want to. I'll call it sample flowchart, and you can see it's going to be stored in the XML format. When I click on create, I wind up with a very comprehensive interface that's almost like working with a desktop application. I've got a file menu over here that allows me to save or save as, open recent. In my view menu here, I've got keyboard shortcuts that allow me to open and close the format panel over here on the right, or an outline window if I need to move around within a large flowchart. And I've also got layers in case I want to create a flowchart that has multiple layers. I'm not going to get into that though. The arrange menu will allow us to insert a variety of things. And once we have shapes on the page, we can group and ungroup things and we can align and distribute, which is going to help us keep our flowchart clean and tidy. Down here at the bottom, we also have the ability to create multiple pages. So if I click on this plus, now I have two different pages within this document that I created. Creating a flowchart couldn't be easier. You simply determine whether you want to have a portrait page or a landscape page, and also what paper size you want to be able to print at. Portrait, of course, would be good for vertical flowcharts, and landscape would be good for horizontal flowcharts. Over here on the left side, I can close up the general tab, and notice when I scroll down, I can see that I've got a flowchart node here, and we can see some familiar shapes from the previous lecture. When you hover over them, they give you an indication of their purpose, just in case you forget. If I scroll down, you see I've got my Terminator, so I can drag one of those onto the screen, and if I double-click inside it, I can type some text. If I want to, I can 
select that text and use various formatting tools up here at the top to, for instance, increase the size, make it bold, italic, centered, and so on. I can even change which font I want to use. Of course, I can click on any shape and drag to resize it vertically and horizontally. I can also use desktop keyboard shortcuts like Control C and Control V to duplicate things. And notice I get guides that help me align things. I can double click in here and type finish. That text looks smaller to me than the start. So if I double click in there and specify 14, now they're the same. Now, of course, I can click on process to drop a process in and move that into place. Or I could just as easily click on predefined process and move that into place as well. Drag to resize. And to connect things up, you simply hover over this and move to any one of these blue dots you see on the border. And once you see that green light up, you can click and drag to any one of these blue dots on the receiving shape. When that line is selected, you can jump over here on this side and change the colors or the thickness of that line by simply increasing and decreasing these controls over here. You can just as easily delete items by clicking on them and then right clicking and selecting delete or simply hitting the delete key on your keyboard. I can click and drag a decision diamond right over here and again hover here and connect to that. And if I wanted to have a yes and no branch like we discussed, I can double click inside my diamond and type in any kind of question I want to represent that decision. Then of course drag another process on and connect this to that and this to that. And when I want to label my paths, I can double click on this line and type yes there. And if I didn't want to put the text right in the line like that, I can just as easily double click in the white space out here and start typing text right there and click and drag to move that wherever I want. And even use my keyboard left and right arrows to move it around. And notice I can click here to rotate the text as well. And I can use Control Z to undo that. So as you can see, there's a surprising amount of capability here in this web-based tool. You can right click and drag around to move it. Or like I mentioned before, you can open up this view outline and use that to move around on a large flowchart. You can also change the colors of any of these shapes, add in gradients and select the colors for the gradient. North, south, east, west. You can change the opacity so that this thing becomes transparent. So lots of control over how your flowchart looks. When you're ready to save, it's a simple matter of jumping to the file menu and clicking on save or save as. Notice here I can save it locally. And if I click on save as instead, I can save that sample flowchart to Google Drive, Dropbox, GitHub, my local device, Trello, and so on. So all in all, draw.io is a very powerful tool. And surprisingly enough, it is free for anybody to use. Oh, and one last thing I'll mention before I go is that if your process is simply too big to fit on a one-page flowchart, it can be a great idea to create a simple high-level overview on page one. And I'll right-click down here on this tab and rename this as high-level overview and click rename. And then if this particular thing here was some more complex process, I might double click in there and type in complex process A, for instance. And then for page two, I would right click on this and rename to complex process A. And then of course, in here, I would create a flowchart that represents that part of the process. So we would keep our high level process clean and we would have named references from here down into other more detailed sub processes. To fully appreciate the benefit of that process, you can go ahead and right click on your sub process node and select edit link. And here you can click on this radio button and you can say that when you click on that, that will take us to complex process A. Optionally, you can load up some other process that's already saved in these output locations. When I click on apply, Notice now that when I click on complex process A, I get a hyperlink down here that when I click on it, takes me directly into complex process A. Pretty cool. 
Now that you know some of the basics about creating flowcharts, and you've seen a demo of how to create a flowchart using draw.io, let's have a look at what a popular RPA tool provides us from a flowchart perspective. Many top RPA tools give us the ability to build our processes with flowcharts. In this lecture, I'm going to demonstrate how UiPath handles it because I think they have a very intuitive and straightforward tool. I'll start by clicking on the blank project option, and I'll name this flowchart demo. And you'll find even more information about how to do this stuff in the UiPath level one course. Now that I've named my project and specified where to store it, I'll click on create. I'll double click up here to close up this ribbon and open up my activities tab on the left side here. So if I expand the system node here and then open activities and then statements, you see that I have this flowchart activity and also a sequence activity. We've got state machine as well, but that's a more advanced topic. For now, I'm going to stick with flowchart and sequence. Flowchart is exactly what it sounds like and gives us the ability to build up a process using nodes and connector lines, just like we did in the previous lectures. Sequence is more of a container for a series of linear steps, one after the other. And there's no need to connect them with arrows because it's assumed that the entire sequence is going to be executed from start to finish. So if I click and drag a flowchart onto my canvas, the default zoom level is 100%. I'm going to control and use my mouse wheel to zoom out a little bit so we can see a little bit more of the canvas. This start icon up at the top represents that start terminator symbol that we saw in the previous lectures. And I can leave it here top dead center if I want to have a vertical flowchart, or I can simply click and drag it and move it to the left if I want to do a horizontal flowchart. What's cool about UiPath is that it is an RPA tool and it's going to allow us to create a functional flowchart. This thing will actually do some work. The easiest way for me to demonstrate what I mean is to jump back over here into activities and type in log message. When I click and drag this activity onto the screen, you can see that I have this rectangular box and I can click up here and actually change the title of what I'm expecting is going to happen. So in this case, I'll put a title on here that says alarm goes off, just like that previous lecture we saw. I'll click and control C to copy and paste that. And I'll click up here and change this to get out of bed. And again, just like that previous lecture, I'll simply hover over this start node and you see there's an outlet here, like a little port. I'll click there and drag down to that and let go. So now I've connected my start node to this log message activity, and I can do the same thing to connect this one to that. These little blue icons are simply warnings that are telling me that there is an argument missing for this message activity. And I can provide that by simply pulling this out a little bit and typing in a message here that I want to emit when this thing runs. So I'll open up some quotes and type in the alarm went off. And that's just some text that's going to get emitted down here in this output area when we run this robot. I'll click on get out of bed and I'll click up here again, open my quotes and type in I'm getting up. So now when I click on this play button up here, this application will vanish for a second and then come back. So when it did that, the robot was actually running. And like I said, this is a flowchart that's doing some work. So when I jump down here into the output panel, you can see that our flowchart started and then we printed the alarm went off, I'm getting up, and then the flowchart execution ended. We didn't have to put a terminator here the way we did in our flowchart examples in the previous lectures. If there are no additional activities, the robot will simply stop on its own. So if you've never seen anything like this happen before, you might be getting kind of excited and connecting the dots regarding how you can use this to get some work done. It is possible to utilize activities in here that actually do things. But what you're more likely going to do, instead of putting those activities in there, is putting in containers like a sequence. And if I click and drag that in there, we see our sequence. Or if I click on activities again, I'll type in flowchart once more. And now I've got the same flowchart that I clicked on before in system activity statements. I just found it faster because I searched for it up here in activities. 
And again, there's more information about this in my UiPath level one course. If I click and drag that on, you can see that the flowchart looks very similar to the sequence. The key difference is the icon in the top left there. This is a straight through series of activities, whereas this is a flowchart that can have nodes like that. Again, we can connect them together with these arrows by hovering over and letting go. And now each of these are simply containers that don't do anything. So you could very easily design a process using sequences or flowcharts to illustrate what you want the software robot to do. And then you could hand it off to your IT team and let them add the functional activities inside here to do the work. Before you do that, you'd of course want to rename these to say something like, get information from system A, and maybe this one here would be enter info into system B. And what's really neat about UiPath is that you can click on this and right click in the header. And if you hover down to annotations here, you can add an annotation. So now we've got this extra little text box and now you can leave some notes for the development team that they might need to accomplish this process. Maybe there's a username and a password they need for that system. And you might even provide the URL for that system. And when you click away, that annotation disappears, but you can see that there's an indicator here that helps them understand that that information is there. And if you want to, you can pin that so that it always stays open. I need to drag this down farther, but you can see that now that sequence has more information sitting out here permanently. And that may or may not be helpful. If you want to remove it, just go ahead and click on this pin again, and it goes away. I could right click here and add an annotation the same way to put in specific info for doing this task. So hopefully that gives you a sense for how you can learn more about your RPA tools flowchart capabilities to potentially help collaborate with the IT team to build a process. To see more of this in action and to see how you can add functional activities into these containers, go ahead and check out the UiPath Level 1 course because I go through all that in there.